This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com coming to you from the hinterlands of the remote Wabash River Valley bottoms where the laws of nature open and on display for all to see. Our Declaration of 76 calls the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. These two volumes, taken together, form a unit, a unity that is inextricable. We can distinguish them in our minds, but they're wound up and bound up together, both of them, as a unit having unity. The two are consonant, one with the other, mutually supportive at all points. To know one and learn one is to know and learn something of the other and vice versa. But in all events, the final rule of life is found in the written specific record meant to be read and ruminated and heard called the Bible. The first volume is meant to be observed and acknowledged in the course of nature and the nature of things. And sometimes men record those observations, and that is what we have with our United States Constitution, the findings of our common law courts, Magna Carta, the Scottish Covenants, the English Declaration of Rights, the Declaration of 76, the laws of Edward the Confessor of England, the laws of King Alfred the Great, are all observations of what is. As the Anglo-Danes used to say, that is what it is. It will not change. It lies unmovable. Log. We get our word law from the old Danish word. The Danes, those folks that the Anglo-Saxons feared. For the Danes were the Vikings and the Danish invasions came, came in hordes with intent to remain, and they did. And as vicious as they were, and they were vicious, their coming into the Anglo-Saxon tribes of England, along with the Celtic tribes already there, whose law was substantially the same, as Algernon Sidney tells us. The Anglos, the Saxons, the Danes, and the Celts, and all the Teutonic tribes, their law, called their Volkreich, their Volkreich, we say our common law, their law was substantially the same, strikingly similar, says Sidney, not only in general principles, but in particulars. Today we call it our common law, and the Danes' arrival in England strengthened our common law, and Magna Carta attempts to return to the law of the Anglo-Danes, as our Constitution of the United States also attempts to do, because the Norman invasion of 1066 brought the imprint of Rome under the common law, and it did not work. And one of the things that the imprint of Rome brought to England was the centrality of the crown, the all-powerfulness of the crown, and what the crown did was. The crown changed things a little. The common law stayed in place, but when the Normans got there, they'd been on the coast of France. They were from Norway originally and had been there about 165 years, but they had received the imprint of the law of Babylon called the Roman law. It affected them being there in France, and they brought it with them to England. One of the things they began to do when they got there because of the imprint of the law of Babylon, the Roman law, the law of the city, they said, you Anglo-Danes are electing your sheriffs popularly county by county, shire by shire. We're going to have sheriffs just like you always did. No change except we will appoint the sheriff. He was the shire reeve, the county, the agent of the county, agent of the people. Well, he became the agent of the crown when old Rufus, old Red, got there, William I. And a couple of generations later, a few generations later, King John allowed to the sheriffs in each county a tyrannical rule, of course, under his control. That's what he wanted. And the sheriffs of the counties became notorious because they were no longer under the control of the people, voted in and voted out at their desire, but were under the control of the crown. It'd be as it were today if the governors of every state appointed the sheriffs in every county. Well, if that happened, friends, neighbors, and relatives, those sheriffs would be dependent upon the governor of the state for pay and position and appointment. And if the sheriff of each county did not buy enough tickets to the local fundraiser for the governor's re-election, or talked bad about the governor, or did not follow his policy, he would be dismissed. And as such, then, centralizing of power would come to the states, and the governors would control entirely who got arrested and who didn't. And anyone who disagreed with him would be arrested. He would seek ways to hamper, hassle their lives. Well, Magna Carta, Stephen Langton wrote Magna Carta. And Stephen Langton, the man that gave us our chapter divisions to our Bible, which we still use today in our English Bibles, Stephen Langton said no more. 
and the viciousness of sheriffs in the local counties, the tyrannical nature of their administration. The landowners of England said, we've got to stop this. One fellow is so bad, he's named by name. As one commentator said, he is branded by name. Magna Carta calls him out by name. Sheriff, sheriff of the county of Gloucester, a galoot by the name of Ingelard of Kaigoni. Kaigoni, there's that French influence coming with the Norman barons. See, he was one of those Normans. Of course, we've heard of Sheriff of Nottingham in the days of Robin Hood, Robin of Loxley. Vicious, dangerous men held their own courts right in the county. And from their court there was no appeal. And so they were, by that function, judges in the county. Without appeal, they were lawgivers in the terms of our ancient law. Lawgiver is a god. Because the final arbiter of right and wrong in particular instances of dispute, in particular cases, is a lawgiver. He controls everything, and whoever controls that controls all. That's why in America we have juries, and we need to keep them, and we need to use them more, not less, at every level, even down to the township level, and as I said yesterday, even down into our churches. Our local congregations need to seek justice in matters affecting this life, matters of property, not matters, as Magna Carta points out by the terms it uses. Local churches do not have cognizance, jurisdiction over matters of heinous crimes, namely, according to Magna Carta, rape, robbery, murder, arson, and treason. But in all other matters, we need to be settling our differences among ourselves by an agreed-upon jury. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 6, by those least esteemed among you, impanel them. Let them make those decisions. Can you imagine how nice wealthy people would be to those who were least esteemed, who were poor, if they knew that the least esteemed would sit in a jury and could possibly decide the fate of their wealth? This tradition of a jury is inestimable, and the good it would do for all of us. But this chapter of 24 of Magna Carta says, Sheriffs can no longer hold court in the counties. They are nothing more than administrators and enforcers of law, not judges. You see the separation of powers here? They didn't want the executive power, the sheriff, a powerful power, likened to the president of the United States or governors of the states, the executive power, the power of enforcement of the law. They didn't want the sheriff in the county to also be the judge of the law in particular cases, to be, as it were, the lawgiver of the county, from whom there was no appeal. They were happy to give him the executive power. Somebody had to have that, but they didn't want the sheriff to have it. And if we had sheriffs conducting courts without juries in our own counties, well, that's the situation they faced here in Magna Carta. And again, there's the principle of our common law arising, the principle of separation of powers, judicial, legislative, and executive. The enforcer of the law should not be the judge of the law in particular cases. He should not sit on the bench. Edward Coke said, The kings of England at common law were not to sit in judgment as judges. Why? Because the common law said they are not to do that. You've got to remember throughout the rest of the world, all of the world's under the law of the city, the Code of Rome, and it's two or three forms, the canon law. But that canon law is substantially the same as the Code of Justinian, the Corpus Juris of Justinian. And it comes down to forms, the French form and the German form, the Code of Bismarck and the Code Napoleon. And under those codes... The chief executive, the chief lawgiver, even if it's a single will of the legislature, the courts belong to them, and they instruct the judges that which they must do, and if they don't do it, they lose their position, that is their job, and their paycheck both. They're not educated men, not educated to exercise discernment and judgment. No, not at all. They're not even educated as lawyers. They're educated to be judges. What does that mean? That means to be a cog in the machinery, to enforce the will of the state called the law, the code. There is no action upon the case in a civil law country. That means there is no action upon the case in all of the world. No common law juries. All of these common law first principles are mixed into what is spoken of here in chapter 24 in one short sentence. And yes, the Bible upholds these ideas. The Bible never let anyone, any king in Israel, gather all three powers of the executive, the enforcer of the law, the judicial, the judger of the law and its application, or the legislative power, anyone who tried to gather all three of those powers into a single will was destroyed. God destroyed them. That's, by the way, what happened to Saul, king of Israel. He had exercised the law of prophets, speaking to men for God, that is the legislative power, and he attempted to also exercise the priestly power, that is the judicial power, and God for that ripped, it says, tore his authority 
his melech in the Hebrew tongue, his kingdom from him. So the laws of nature's God, along with the laws of nature as observed here, Magna Carta, are consonant, mutually supportive. And chapter 24 of Magna Carta says that judges need to be neutral umpires, administrators of jury trials, not sheriffs appointed by the crown to sit in judgment, not the executive power to sit in judgment in the local county in order to crush opposition to his power and the crown's power. Now, you give a governor the power to control sheriffs in local counties, and that, as it were, is what has happened here in Magna Carta in those days. And it makes no difference how good, G-O-O-D, a man you might think he is. He's not. And he will use that power to exert his will. We are not the government of men. Do not trust upon getting good men into office. It won't help because men are not fundamentally good. They seek their own will. We don't want that. We want a government of law. Law is to govern our relationships. True law from the true lawgiver. Now the barons here, chapter 24 of Magna Carta, were merely demanding that the crown observe the rules it had laid down for its own guidance. That means they were requiring that the crown observe its own regulations. Regulations, by the way, in executive orders, those two species of our government are meant not to bind us, the people of the United States, but they are, if they're used right, meant to bind government dependents and employees. Government employees are dependents upon government, just like welfare recipients. And all government employees, bureaucrats, need keep that in mind and execute their offices accordingly. It is the characteristic we call humility. You want to have power? It comes through humility, true power, the power of true authority. Understanding you're dependent upon those that you are commissioned to serve. For example, the President of the United States may issue executive orders, and those orders are, the law says, to control, to govern employees of the government working in the executive branch, that and no other, that and no more. But through those, a lot of nasty things can be done if those executive orders are not pursuant to true law. Same thing with regulations, for example, regulations of the IRS. Internal policies. The IRS is bound to follow its own law, the law it lays down for itself, its policies, its regulations. Well, that's what the landowners of England here said with Magna Carta. It said the executive power, the crown of England, as our president and our governor's executive power, got to follow their own rules. That way we know what to expect and we can plan for the future. In short, caprice, the imperious breath of the whims of men in government, must give way to law. Let me put it in stronger terms because this is what really happens. Lust of men must give away to law, true law. And local sheriffs in the counties of England must not usurp the function of coroners, for example. Our office sheriff came from our common law, tradition, and, and a lot can be learned about their duties from this document, Magna Carta, especially chapter 24. Along with sheriffs at Anglo-Saxon law and old Anglo-Saxon England, when the sheriffs were chosen by the folk, F-O-L-K, the folk of the county, the kings began to appoint coroners. Coroners. The word coroner comes from the word crown. He was a crown appointment. The sheriff chosen by the people, the coroner appointed by the crown. But the coroner did not have the job of the sheriff, and so the coroner didn't have that kind of power. The sheriff was there to check the power of the crown's appointment called the coroner. And neither one of those two offices, sheriffs, locally chosen, coroners appointed by the crown in the county, these were not to usurp the king's justices. This all comes down to separation, disbursement of power, so that no one person or bevy of persons can gather all of the power into their hands and rule by a single will. This chapter 24, just a few short words, a heading is plumb packed with application today. It is amusing. A fellow doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. I've heard English, British commentators say, well, only a few parts of Magna Carta are applicable today, enforced today. I've heard American common lawyers say the same thing. Taint so, taint true. These first principles, separation of power, are a common law doctrine, not part of the law of the city, only the law of the land. And they're found in the Bible, by the way, clearly. These are still good law found here, Magna Carta chapter 24. This is Brent Allen Winters, www.commonlawyer.com. Please stay with us. We'll be right back for the second segment of this hour here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.
This is Brent, Alan Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. We're back for the second segment of this hour talking about Magna Carta. Magna Carta, signed 800 years ago this year on the 15th of June, the year 1215. On a plain, a low plain, an island, as it were, of the Thames River, an observation and agreement between the government and the landholders of England as to what was right and what was wrong. What is the law? In those days, not called the common law, but called by different denominations, different names, called the law of the land, called the laws of Edward the Confessor, and sometimes still called the laws of King Alfred. The common law has had different names through the years. Today we call it the common law. Our constitution still called it the law of the land, Article 6, and our common law is a law of process. Due process focused on the course, staying on the course, keeping the course. Not a result-oriented law, like the law of the city. The law of the city must achieve a particular result, and that particular result, in every case, is the will of the state, the will of the powers that be, whether it be the single will of an emperor, or the single will of a legislature, or an empress, or some other kind of a shaman. But the single will of men governs in those cases. We say in the United States... For that very reason, we are not the government of men, whether it be one man or the single will of a bevy, a combination of men. We are a government of law, and that law supersedes men, existed before men, has always existed. Indeed, right and wrong have always been right and wrong. There never was a time when any particular thing spoken of becomes right and that had been previously wrong. No, the principle, as our Supreme Court has pointed out over and over again, The first principles of right and wrong never change. It's always been wrong to steal, and it remains wrong to steal. They say, well, maybe we should, and maybe we do. Indeed, some say we have redefined stealing, rape, treason, arson, murder. Redefined them? No, you don't redefine those. Even the principles, the first principles that govern the definition of those never changes. Oh, there are new applications, new ways of stealing, new ways of committing robbery and rape. It was curious indeed to listen to that woman on that YouTube, that head, that big shot with Planned Parenthood, talking about manipulating the law, bringing the babies out breech so that their brains could be scrambled before their head came out of the womb, because if the baby came out non-breech, the head would be out first and the killing of the baby would be murder. But if the baby came out breach, the abortionist, the murderer, could insert an instrument and kill the baby by a trauma to the head, and then the law says it's not murder. No, redefining things like that is an intentional killing of innocent life. And those that do such things are partakers of murder. The definition doesn't change So it is with Magna Carta. We're talking here, though, about something a little different. We're talking about the power of a single will gathered into one hand by controlling the pay and the appointment of sheriffs. A deviation from our common law. Our common law says no sheriffs are to be chosen locally to enforce the law within the county. They are not to be chosen from a distant ruler or a distant will. In this case, the king, way down at Westminster, he said, well, the local counties can no longer choose their sheriffs as they did in old Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Dane England, uh, I'll choose them for them. And the abuses at that point got plumb out of hand, and the sheriff became the hammer for the king to crush all political opposition locally. This has forever been the move of men in government, any way to gain local control. This is the reason for the insertion of post offices in every tiny hamlet in America. Or in those early days when they were inserted, the post offices were there to keep track at the request of government bureaucracies of who's communicating with who. And yes, it goes on today with a vengeance. I've had clients that have been investigated by the government unjustly discover that the postmaster in their little village, who they thought were their friends and helpers, had been spying on them by orders from above. Much shame came when they were discovered that they had breached their loyalty with local folk. Well, that was the very purpose of the post offices and the very purpose of the unconstitutional, unlawful monopoly 
Congress purports to give to the Postal Service to carry letters. It is a monopoly. No one else in America are allowed to carry letters for profit. Even if you go to FedEx, you've got to put your letter. If you want them to carry it, you put it in a package. Letters, those only the Postal Service says the government can carry, and they'll prosecute a person for a crime if he tries to do otherwise. But those were inserted, and that monopoly was given. An unlawful monopoly. All monopolies are unlawful, but it was given that the federal government could spy upon every person in every place. And then, during the Roosevelt administration, a plan was hatched, a scheme, to put the powerful, formidable presence of the federal government in every county in America, to control the land and all the welfare in that county. And, by the way, all the production of raw materials. As a practical matter, those were called uh, the United States Department of Agriculture offices. We have them here in every county now. And the Department of Agriculture does a whole lot of things that has nothing to do with agriculture, including the distribution of welfare stamps, and now, of course, it's electronic. But to control agriculture, there is a federal office in every county in America. What a massive undertaking. Now, postal offices in every little hamlet, United States federal departments of agriculture do no more than impede production, by the way, and trespass without warrants onto people's land and into their grain bins. Well, that's what King John was doing here in Magna Carta, and the principle, as I pointed out before, never changes, and the problems never change. The problems, as it is said, are perennial. The never-ending gathering of power into a single will, called a monopoly, a monopoly, as with the carrying of letters. By the way, as with welfare, the government now oppresses all those that attempt to help others on their own dime. Well, as we'd said, sheriffs and coroners were not to hold trials in the county. Sheriffs appointed by the central government, coroners, that's a word from the word crown, means one appointed by the crown to ride herd on the sheriff, but their jobs are distinct, different. We had sheriffs and coroners that were supposed to administer trials, not actually try the cases themselves. Then later, in the 1400s, the 15th century, The justices of the peace were put in place to do some of those jobs. Now the justices of the peace are a kind of a magistrate that handles smaller cases. And I said the kind of cases that were said to be petty, misdemeanors, for example. Well, what Magna Carta did, chapter 24 here, is insist that no sheriff or local magistrate should encroach, trespass upon the province reserved for the upper courts formed to try the major crimes. Grave crimes. Now, only the sovereign is allowed to do that. In America, the sovereign is the state governments. Arson, rape, murder, robbery, and treason. Only state governments, the sovereign, their courts, those courts, the people's courts, as many states put it, only they are to try those kinds of crimes, those high crimes, as our Constitution puts it, following our common law. Well, I'd mentioned these four kinds of people, sheriffs, coroners, etc., and because these still are among us, it'd be a good idea to discuss their origins in our common law. The sheriff, for example. Long before the Norman Conquest, the year 1066, each shire, those were the counties, later called counties, but each shire of England entrusted the government affairs of their own shire, their own county, to an agent, an agent of their own appointing, known as a shire garifa, shire Garifa. That's old Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Dane for Shire agent. Shire Garifa. Shire agent, an agent of the people of the Shire, appointed by the people. And when the Normans got there in the year 1066, they continued this office, but gave increased powers and called him by a different name, called him by a Latin name. And there's the imprint of the Roman law of the city. They called him vice comitis. That means agent of the county, county agent. And it is of great significance that the departments of agriculture that have put an office in every county in America, federal office, call the leader of that office the county agent, vice comitis, an office of the law of the city. But in England, during the Anglo-Saxon times, way back there, the power of the shire, the power of the county, as it later came to be called, was lodged in three kinds of officers. Number one, the bishop, and number two, the earl, and number three, the sheriff. The bishop, the earl, and the sheriff. All three of these of their own appointment, the appointment of the people of the county. No, Rome had nothing to do with appointing the bishop, not until the 7th century. 
And even then, that was a very limited power. Very few people in England would go along with it. But when the Normans got there, they took the bishop out of the mix, and the Roman church came into full force under William the Conqueror in England. Well, I say full, they had an opportunity to try to get full force. They never did, never had. But they were certainly stronger, and it caused a lot of killing and trouble and war. Well, once the bishop was taken out of the mix, the sheriff was left without a rival within his county, his shire. He was the king's man, he did the king's bidding, and he crushed all those who opposed the king, and he, of course, was in it for his own profit. Collecting taxes for the crown, over-collecting, keeping what he could, just as they did in the days of the Roman Empire, just as they did in the days of the Newer Testament. Rome appointed tax collectors. They didn't care how much they collected as long as they gave Rome what Rome demanded. And tax collectors took four and five times the amount they were entitled to take, and Rome enforced that, said it was their payment. I have watched bankruptcy trustees take everything, including the wedding rings and wedding bands, right off of the fingers of ladies that stood before the bankruptcy court. Look down and say, what's that on your finger? Wedding ring, is it gold? Yes. Then you must give it to me. Well, that's the way the sheriffs were under William the Conqueror. Not only was he the local magistrate trying cases in courts, not only was he the local tax gatherer and local judge, but he commanded the troops of the militia of the county. Now in England, unlike America, the high sheriff of each county is appointed by the king, still. But in America, we decided to go back, as Justice James Wilson of the United States Supreme Court said, back to Anglo-Saxon England to reach back before Magna Carta. And as one commentator rightly observed, in America the sheriff is an office very practical in each county, performed sometimes by him in person, and he may even set out at the head of the posse comitatus in pursuit of criminals. A British commentator made that comment, and he is absolutely correct. Not so in England. But then Magna Carta talks about the constable. Remember, the sheriff is the shire agent, the agent of the people. Shire Reeve, we slur it into sheriff. And then the constable is a police. A police, and police is a word meaning city in Greek. It has to do with the city. Policemen are confined within the counties in America still to the jurisdiction of the cities, where the sheriff has jurisdiction over the whole caboodle. The sheriff's jurisdiction was the county, The constable's jurisdiction was in each village or town, a local law enforcement officer. Bottom line, any peace officer less than a sheriff over a smaller area than a sheriff acting within a smaller jurisdiction than the county was called a constable. And then Magna Carta mentions coroners. Coroners, of course, coroners are with us yet today in each of our counties. As I'd before said, the word coroner is related to the word crown because the coroners were appointed by the crown of England after their institution in England in the year 1194 seemed to have shared with the sheriff many of his powers. But that was not part of our common law. The function that has come down to us from those ancient times is the coroner was to investigate deaths, to determine causes of death, to examine and come to conclusions concerning wounds where there were charges of mayhem, injury to the limbs of men and women. And he was to keep a watchful eye for treasure trove and shipwrecks if along the sea or the rivers, for the admiralty jurisdiction of the crown had an interest in such things. But today, the coroner's duties are confined to inquests on dead bodies where there are suspicious circumstances. And this is the important point also. The coroner of the county in America acts in the place of the sheriff, If the sheriff becomes unavailable or otherwise absent for some reason, the coroner takes up the sheriff's duties. And then finally, there's the bailiff. The bailiff. Magna Carta mentions here, chapter 24, another local officer. A bailiff is a second-level government employee. Defined this way, a bailiff is someone who has received a redelegation of authority from another person. For example, the sheriff is delegated authority direct from the people. But if the sheriff deputizes someone, that authority is indirect to the person to whom he deputizes. A redelegation of authority from the sovereign, from the state, from the people themselves, is an indirect delegation of authority. Well, bailiffs are given authority from men like sheriffs and coroners, or maybe even a judge in a court. We think of the bailiff of the courtroom. Whatever jurisdiction is given to the bailiff is called his bailiwick, the sphere of his authority, even sometimes applied to the sheriff, 
saying the county is his bailiwick. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Please stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Talking about Magna Carta, the big paper signed 800 years ago this year, 15 June, the year 1215, a recordation of the observations of men concerning the laws of nature, the way things are, that which arises from the nature of things, and it's put forth as an agreement between the crown of England and the landholders of England. It is an expression of our common law of government and other things, other first principles of our common law. Our constitution lifts these first principles out, puts them up in puts them in a bit of a different expression to apply them to a bit of a different circumstance. But nonetheless, our Constitution is a grand attempt to reestablish, to restate, over 500 years after Magna Carta, its first principles. And Magna Carta is a restatement of principles that had been stated hundreds of years before on various and different occasions. We're in chapter 24 talking about sheriffs, constables, and bailiffs. Those are the three offices of which Magna Carta refers here, attempting to put the responsibility of the county sheriff back in the county and take it away, take control of the sheriff away from the king. The sheriffs had become nothing more than lackeys of the central government. In the United States, we attempted to establish our sheriffs, harking back to Magna Carta, which means harking back to Anglo-Dane England, when the sheriffs were elected, not appointed by the central government. The governors of our states do not appoint sheriffs in our states. In the local counties, they're elected. That was the old Anglo-Dane custom, and therefore are not answerable to the governor of the state for their jobs and pay. And if they are, then the governor, of course, controls them entirely, and they become nothing more than yes-men for the governor, and he uses them, inevitably he will, to crush all political opposition by force. Though we define the sheriff, we talked about the coroner being the second man in power in the counties in England and now in America. And now we talk about the bailiff. The word bailiff may be applied to every individual to whom authority of any sort has been delegated, watch this, by another. A bailiff, then, is a fellow that has re-delegated authority. For instance, every person has an authority over his tongue delegated to him by his creator. We call that freedom of speech and the right to remain silent. Those two together are the flip side of the same responsibility of a non-delegable duty, a non-delegable right. I cannot delegate my right over my tongue to any other person, and in the final day I will answer, as the Bible says, for every idle word spoken. Some duties, some rights, and that's what a right is, it's a duty, are non-delegable. You cannot give them to anybody else. That's why, of course, it is said these are fundamental rights. Inalienable, it is impossible for any person to extricate himself and assumes our founding documents. You cannot extricate yourself or separate yourself, remove yourself from your fundamental rights. Even if you do that and say, well, someone else has the rights over my responsibility to direct the education of my children. That's a fundamental right given to parents from God. No, not from government. And if you turn that right over, for example to the state, to government, to educate your children, and they botch it, they don't do the job that God wants, you will answer. You will answer for whatever went wrong. Some would say, well, then you can delegate the duty, but you can't delegate the responsibility. Delegate the duty to the state to educate your children, but the responsibility remains yours. That's a difference without a difference, because responsibility is a duty. I know what people mean when they say that, but it really becomes meaningless. Bottom line, it's non-delegable. But a bailiff, he's a fella to whom duty is delegated that has been delegated to the delegator. Consider, for example, the Constitution of the United States delegates duty to the three branches of government in three officers, presidents, congressmen, and judges, namely Supreme Court judges. And then those persons, those classes of persons, can re-delegate some of the authority of which they have been delegated to other persons. The president delegates authority, for example, to the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. That is a redelegated authority. Well, a bailiff is a man locally in the county to whom authority has been delegated to him by, for example, the county sheriff or a judge in the county. 
That's why we have court bailiffs in court, for example. They operate either or both under the authority, the delegated authority of the sheriff or of the judge in that courtroom. And then the sheriff, of course, has authority to deputize deputies. There again is redelegated authority. At common law, those deputies are in that sense bailiffs. The sheriff also has authority given to him by the people of the county to summon the posse comitatus, the posse, as is said in the old western movies. And once he has done that, he has redelegated some of the authority delegated to him. And in that sense, such persons of the posse are under the terms of the old common law, bailiffs. A bailiff is a person who receives authority delegated to him from one having been delegated authority. And then finally, the jurisdiction or district, it could be geographic, over which a bailiff has been delegated authority is called his bailiwick. Bailiwick. And the word bailiwick has come to signify, or in particular cases to denote, the scope of a jurisdiction of authority given to any person. Now we come to Magna Carta chapter 25. Out of 63 chapters says this, again, these headings, these chapters are short. This is one short sentence. It says this, all counties, hundreds, wapentakes, and tridings shall remain at the old rents and without any additional payment. To understand this chapter 25, it is necessary to understand somewhat of the history of that which it speaks. Never forget, when studying an old text of law, and every text of law, by the way, is old in this sense, it all happened, all the texts of law were put in place in the past. It could be an hour ago, a day ago, a year ago, ten years ago, twenty, fifty, a hundred, a thousand years ago, or as in the case of the Bible, going back a couple of thousand years at minimum. But in all of those cases, the first thing a fellow has to decide is, what does it literally say? And what did it literally say to the folks that wrote it? Don't get caught up into this foolish, brainless talk about whether or not we should take a text literally. Indeed, if you don't take every text literally that you read, especially in law, and that includes the Bible, you first must understand the literal meaning before you can ever understand any indirect symbolic meaning. People say, oh, that's symbolic. We can't take that literal. That may be true, but you first have to understand what it says by the letters in order to have any idea of what its symbol means. Never forget, every letter and every word is by definition a symbol. All speech is symbolic in that sense. So we must first understand it by the letters. No less true here. Centuries before the Norman Conquest, England had already been mapped out into shires, and those shires had boundaries. And those boundaries in England are still there. The counties of England have the same boundaries as the shires of old Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Dane England. Nothing has changed in that respect. But centuries before the Norman conquest of old Rufus, old Red, William I, back in the year 1066 A.D., all of these shires were established. And today they're called counties. But in those early days, we're talking 1,500 years ago, those counties, those shires, were subdivided into smaller jural entities, smaller geographic divisions. For example, in America, we have townships. The counties are divided into townships. Well, in Old England, as also in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, even yet today, the counties are divided further, not into townships necessarily, especially New Jersey. I think Pennsylvania has ceased doing this. They were divided in what are called hundreds, hundreds, especially in the south of England. A hundred is a geographic area said to embrace about ten families, including servants and children and extended family, about 10 families on an average, then encompassing 100 people. And this geographic area was called a hundred, or as the older English might say, an hundred. And in the northern parts where the Danish influence was stronger, they were called wapentakes, wapentakes. So hundreds, the counties were divided into hundreds in the south, in the north, and especially over to the east, where the Danes had settled, These same divisions, they were exactly the same, comprising about a hundred families of geographic area. They were called wapentakes. And in some of the large counties of York and Lincoln, they were called trithings or ridings. Trithings or ridings. By the way, the word wapentake means weapon touch. As to touching weapons and these hundreds, 
in the south, these wapentakes in the north, and these trithings, or ridings, in the larger counties, were all put in place to better enable the militia to be quickly mustered in case of invasion or danger. The militia, very much a part of our common law tradition, is fundamental to it, by the way, and that's why it's fundamental to the preservation and integrity of our own constitution. There are four militia clauses, and these four militia clauses literally, there's that word again, hold together our constitution of the United States, the government of it. But that's why these divisions existed in old England. But because the crown had taken over control of the sheriffs from the people in violation of our common law custom, the sheriffs then had control of yearly rent payments on land held by the crown, and he was given the power, not the right, but the power, the king gave it to him, to appropriate to his own uses any tax revenues or rents from his county. So the crown it So the crown let him send to the central government whatever the law required, and he was allowed to keep the rest. Well, therefore, he could flee, steal, skin the people to the extent he wanted. Take four, five, six, whatever he could get out of them, milk them dry. Send as much as the central government demanded and keep the rest. That, by the way, as we'd pointed out, was the system used in the Roman Empire. Tax collectors were appointed, and the government protected them in their thievery to take anything they wanted as long as the government got what the law said was coming to it from that particular province or bailiwick of that tax collector. As one commentator put it, John, John Lackland, king that signed Magna Carta at the points of the swords of the landholders of England, he appointed men of the baser sort, this guy calls them the less reputable type, And he gave them, watch this, a rope. A rope, yes, for hanging people. The phrase, he gave them a rope, says the commentator, that means he gave them the power to hang people that disagreed with him. These fellows were nothing but glorified thugs, as tax collectors often are, bitter thugs. He allowed his sheriffs to inflict severities on the people, such as hanging, torture, lopping off ears and noses to put the fear in them so they would give up anything he asked and he could keep whatever he could get out of them as long as King John got what he said was owed to him. Bottom line here, this provision, chapter 25, is an attempt to stop the courts from being used as instruments of extortion. To stop the courts from being used as instruments of extortion of taxes, so-called. Instead of being independent, courts of independent judgment, the courts had become a tool of the state for vindicating its will. And in a curious case that came before the justices in the year 1226, 11 years after Magna Carta, and these words are significant, the complaint was made that the things, the courts were called the things, as they had been in ancient, more ancient England, under the old Nordic law, the Germanic law, common law, The courts, the juries, and the eldership were called the things. Sometimes the vowels would change. They were called the thangs, T-H-A-N-G-S. And sometimes the thungs, T-H-U-N-G-S. But therein is the meaning, important meaning, of our word thing. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. You can find my books at Amazon.com. Just type in my name, and they'll come up, Brent Allen Winters, and you can find there my comparative law text concerning our common law called Excellence of the Common Law, tracing the history of our common law, along with the history of its grand antagonist through the centuries, the civil law from the founding, the settling of the city of Babylon, on to Egypt, thence back to Babylon, then to Pergamos, then to Rome, and then scattered throughout the world on every continent, including the two forms of the Corpus Juris of Justinian, the form it finally took under the Roman Emperor Justinian, the French form called Code Napoleon, and the German form called Code Bismarck, along with the canon law of Rome, and now governing every country on the face of our planet, with the exception of just a handful of common law countries, and where those codes do not govern directly, the principles of the law of the city do govern, and these are opposed according to this text, and I point this out throughout, opposed to the law of the land, our common law, and tracing throughout its pages the antagonism between the law of the land, our common law, and the law of the city, the law of the evil empire. In light of 
the laws of nature's God written and the laws of nature unwritten in creation. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Join us again next time at this same time here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.